Hello, welcome everyone to today uh, to the start of a brand new webinar series that we are hosting called Science at the Edge. Um, I'm your host, Kristen Uhlenbrock. I'm the director of the Institute for Science and Policy, a project here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Um, a huge thanks, obviously, to my team for helping bring this together um, and the many colleagues that are working behind the scenes. So as I mentioned, uh, in this series, we're going to be talking about new ideas and innovations in science and technology and how it influences society. So this is the first episode that we're going to be bringing you, and we're going to be bringing you a whole broad range of topics uh, over the coming months. In this very first episode, we are taking on this very hot topic that many of you probably heard of, which is generative AI or artificial intelligence and its impact on misinformation. Um, generative AI is that type of artificial intelligence that can generate text and images and other media uh, in response to prompts that you give in it. Maybe you've heard of ChatGPT or Dolly or one of these other language and image learning platforms. So we're going to learn a little bit about what these platforms are and how do they work today. Um, but we're also going to learn about how it impacts and influences many aspects of our society, including in misinformation. I do want to do just a quick pulse for those of you who've joined us today from all over the country. Welcome. Um, about if you've actually used one of these platforms. So Nicole's going to throw up a quick poll here real quick. Um, about if you've used any of these generative AI platforms. There's a lot of them out there. These are just some examples. So just kind of want to see if yes, no, or actually I don't know if I've used one before. Um, so we're going to cover a lot of ground in the next hour, uh, talking a little bit about how this technology uh, is used um, in, in impacting misinformation, impacting kind of our media landscape, uh, impacting the trustworthiness of information in this really heavily information saturated world. We're going to cover topics ranging ethics and policy and probably copyright and biases and all kinds of big wonderful topics. Uh, we're not going to get to everything. That This is a really big big topic to take on, um, but we're going to cover some interesting areas and, and um, we're going to hopefully incorporate some of your questions throughout today. So as you heard Nicole say right before you joined here at the top of the hour, uh, open the chat, ask your questions in the chat feature. I'm going to pull themes and questions from that and work them into our conversation. Uh, a huge apologies in advance if you have a very specific question and we don't answer it. Um, we often get a lot of interest and so we'll do our best throughout today's program to cover a lot of the questions that you have. Um, but I'm going to bring in our guest and say welcome and hello today and, and hand this over to her. Um, I'm very pleased to have Dr. Casey Fiesler joining us today. Uh, Casey is an associate professor in the Department of Information Sciences right here in our backyard at University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, she also has multiple affiliations with the Silicon Flatirons, which is the law school, as well as the Atlas Institute. Uh, Casey has a PhD in human-centered computing, um, as well as a law degree. Uh, and her work is primarily focused around technology ethics and law and online communities. She has also been actively engaged in a champion for broadening and empowering participation in computing. Uh, thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Fiesler. Casey, how are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I'm great. Good. Well, I'm excited. So we're going to have a little bit of a presentation, just kind of setting the stage. Uh, around 10 or 15 minutes. We'll see how that goes and then we'll head into a conversation. So let me pass this over to you and say, please take it away. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna be doing, a, 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 as she said, a very uh, short presentation here um, with the intention to explain uh, what generative AI is and enough about how it works in very simplistic terms uh, with the goal of of understanding types of misinformation um, that might come out of technologies like this. Um, so I imagine all of you have seen a lot of headlines <laughs> about this. Uh, um, over the past year or so, especially, it was actually last summer that OpenAI's arch generators, um, uh, Dolly and some some others made by uh, others, uh, others than OpenAI also uh, were announced and people started using them. And so that's when these headlines really started, but it really kicked off in December when ChatGPT was released. Um, and if you are interested in uh, keeping abreast of what's going on in this phase, um, I actually maintain this running spreadsheet of news articles about AI ethics and policy. And the reason I point this out is because how easy it is every day, 
there's something new and it's it's all you know about what's going on with ai and the new tech and that sort of thing but a lot of it is around the ethical issues and the limitations of these technologies which i think is really important for people to understand and this all starts with how difficult it is to understand like what artificial intelligence is anyway because that is such a broadly used and not always appropriately used term. I think that this cartoon is kind of funny. <laughs> um, maybe maybe AI is just machine learning, it's just statistics. Um, and so I actually thought that I would I would actually briefly start with explaining a, a, a simpler, a somewhat simpler uh, type of AI that you might be familiar with in order to help you understand the difference between that and, and what we're talking about now. Um, so if you've ever heard of machine learning, we are, we are encountering this constantly. When you hear about AI or sometimes you hear about algorithms, this is what we mean. Um, and so I will give you a very simple example here. Let's say that a computer has a data set of thousands and thousands of photographs of cats and dogs. Here's a cat, here's a dog, here's a cat, here's a dog. Um, and then here's a picture of a dog. This is my dog, actually. Um, smart computer, is this a cat or is this a dog? Um, and, and hopefully it knows that it's it's a dog. He is a little bit of a cat-like dog though, but you know, probably, oh, you know, 92% uh, <laughs> uh, accuracy that this is a dog. Uh, but one thing that you might have heard a lot about when it comes to AI is people talking about bias. And imagine that that training data, all the pictures of all the cats and all the dogs, lots of different kinds of cats, but every dog is a golden retriever. So all the dogs in the training data are golden retrievers and you've got all these cats. Suddenly my dog might look more like a cat than a dog because it looks he looks more like a cat than a golden retriever, I think. This is how we end up with problems uh, like this one that you might have heard about uh, from Google a number, of, a number of years ago. Bias in AI often comes because of bias in the training data. If you hear about garbage in, garbage out, that's where that comes from. Another example of this is, let's say uh, that you are creating a um, hiring AI to help you decide who to hire. Um, we know from decades and decades of resume audit studies that humans are sexist and biased or sexist and racist when it comes to decisions about who to hire for jobs. So if that's your training data, then guess what? The AI is also sexist and racist. So this is not super surprising. So machine learning is finding patterns in training data and making predictions. Um, that's what we've been seeing a lot of um, and why, you know, this type of, when you hear about AI and healthcare algorithms, that's what we're talking about. Generative AI is when instead of like labeling things or predicting things based on training data, it's actually creating something new. It's generating something new. So now I can go to Dali and say, give me a dog, give me a cat. And these are dogs and cats that do not exist in, in reality. They're not actual photographs. They also weren't created by an artist. They were created because Dali is trained on, I don't even know, countless um, images of dogs and cats. So it's created a brand new dog or cat. And these are pretty simple. But I could also ask it, for example, um, for a dog and a cat wearing colorful knitted hats surrounded by balloons. Um, I could also ask for a photograph of a dog and a cat in front of the Denver Museum of Nature and, uh, of Nature and Science. Uh, and the cat's wearing a propeller hat and the dog is wearing a green sweater. Um, but if you look closely at this, you'll actually see that there are some problems here. Like there's a propeller uh, in the background of one of these. It's like a, and you know, the hats aren't always quite right. And, and it looks a little weird sometimes. You can see how like the propeller might show up in a weird place. Like now the, the cat has, the dog has like a helicopter on its head. <laughs> Um, and Dolly is not the only system like this. Another one that you might have heard about is Midjourney. And typically when you see these um, like very beautiful uh, realistic images, that's where that's coming from. And again, can create things that do not exist in reality and nature. These are the kinds of things that you would have expected to have seen created by an artist out of their mind. Um, but now I can go to Midjourney and create an image like this. Um, essentially instantly. 
Um, we can also create uh, something that looks like a photograph of a person that does not actually exist or actual people who exist uh, but are doing something that they couldn't be like like uh, Han Solo and Chewbacca with a, a smartphone. Um, and you might be thinking, mm, there's the start of the conversation about misinformation, and you would be right, but we're going to come back to this. Um, another thing that generative AI can do, if you've heard about some of the things that Photoshop with its new um, gen AI capabilities can do, is like fill in the rest of the photograph. So you've ever seen this meme, um, the gel, you know, the 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 um, boyfriend meme. Uh, that's just that square part in the middle is the meme, and the image generator filled in the rest of the scene. So that's image generators. You also might have heard about um, different types of text generators like Google's Bard, um, GitHub Copilot, which helps you write code. Um, but probably what you've heard a whole lot about is ChatGPT. So ChatGPT is a large language model. Um, I, I don't want to go into great detail <laughs> um, about how this works. Um, that would take me a much longer presentation. Um, but the important thing to know is that it's not a search engine. Um, it is like at a very simplistic level, a probability distribution over, over those same kinds of data sets. It would be more accurate to say that ChatGPT is fancy autocomplete than that it is a search engine. It is a, and it, it is really hard for me to express just how good at this it is, but it is a prediction of what word comes next. But the way that it does that is so complicated and impressive that it really does seem like magic. But the important thing to know here is that it's not understanding what you're saying. It is predicting uh, what word is most likely to come next. And this was done um, with a lot of uh, different levels of um, learning, including reinforcement learning, which is where humans uh, rated the responses that it was providing and that went back in and, and to continue to train the model. So let me give you an example. Um, I could ask for an itinerary for enjoying a day at the museum. Uh, does this very well actually and, and actually gives you uh, the correct address um it would probably would not have given you the correct address if you had moved uh since 2020 though um sometimes there will be things that seem a little bit off but overall the, based on my memories of the museum this seems pretty good um another thing that i could ask it to do is write a script for an opening scene of star trek the original series where they visit the museum um, ChatGPT is actually very good at writing fan fiction. Now, is it good fan fiction? Probably not. But the the fact that you could tell it to do pretty much anything and it can do it is very impressive. Um, another thing that I tried out was I asked it to write a Wikipedia entry for me. Um, I'm not on Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> um, but here's where it gets interesting. There are a lot of things here that seem right, but aren't. Um, so you heard my bio earlier about my PhD and my law degree. Um, it also says here that I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia. Um, it's not. My bachelor's degree is from Georgia Tech. Um, and if, I don't know if anyone knows about the rivalry between those two schools, but it's a very big mistake. <laughs> um, it also provided citations, selected publications. Um, all of the people here are people that I have written papers with. Um, and these are topics that I study, but none of these papers exist. These are all completely made up titles of papers that I never wrote and don't exist. Um, I also was not in Forbes 30 under 30, but I, it's actually a little bit flattering that for some reason this model thinks that I should have been. Um, here's where you see things start to break down. Because again, it's not a search engine. It's about what word comes next. And this is a, you know, these are papers that could exist because they sound right. Another thing you should not ask ChatGPT to do is to solve math problems for you. Um, here I was actually trying to show that it might be helpful for like, you know, helping someone with their math homework. So I was like, hey, give me a math problem and don't give me the answer. Um, so then I thought, you know, maybe I could give it the wrong answer and it would correct me and tell me how to do it correctly. But instead I gave it the wrong answer and it was like, good job. Um, and uh, I, I, so I pointed out then why that was incorrect. I was like, does two times four plus five really equal uh, 15? And by the end, is eight plus five 15? Uh, it was like, yeah, totally. Eight plus five, 15. Um, 
So you can see some ways that you might get accidental misinformation. This is very important for students to know about citations, for example. Um, but there are also uh, ways that you could that you could use these technologies to uh, generate uh, deep fakes, for example. So these are two very uh, famous examples from the past few months. Someone on Twitter created, Im in, uh, in, uh, before Donald Trump was arrested, um, created images of him being uh, physically uh, arrested and put them on Twitter and said, I made these. But then people started picking them up and posting them elsewhere. And the, la the next thing you know, they're in news articles. Um, same here, we have um, the Pope with his like puffy <laughs> uh, jacket. Um, neither of these are real, but they fooled a lot of people. Now, deep fakes are not like this is not a brand new thing that you know has come up in the past year. Um, just a couple of years ago, uh, deep fake Tom Cruise went very viral. Um, the, the 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 image here on on the right is a is the deep fake. Um, this was actually posted on TikTok, um, and he sounds exactly like him. He looks exactly like him. You cannot tell that it is fake. But one of the reasons that they were able to do this so well was that the source material was actually a Tom Cruise impersonator. So you can see him on the left here. So they had a Tom Cruise impersonator like do this. And then, you know, lots of mag magic here to make this happen that required a lot of effort um, on the part to make a deep fake that was so good. The thing with the tools that have become popularized in the past year is how easy they are to use. So, um, I, I did not create the Pope in the puffy jacket, of course, but you could do something like this very quickly. Now, the good news is that um, there are ways that you can spot uh, deep fakes um, uh, or just spot AI generated images at all. They often have weird little things. Sometimes they're, they're more than, sometimes they're not even little. Sometimes it's like someone has three arms and it's amazing how you can not notice those things <laughs> until you're looking for them. Um, but of course, you know, these are things that with a little bit of effort you can, you can fix. Um, and of course, uh, people are trying to make the technology better every day. Um, and then the other thing that I want to mention in terms of types of, of misinformation, um, so we have, you know, uh, the unintentional stuff, the mistakes, um, we have people using, uh, using these, um, you know, adversarially, um, and then there's bias in the system. So if you think back to the gorillas example from earlier, um, another thing is that I asked, uh, I asked Midjourney to give me an image of a computer science professor, and it gives me three bald white men and, uh, you know, bald white men lecturing to a room of bald white men. Um, so there are potential types of <laughs> representational harm. Um, I always like to, see, you know, we're going to get to physical robots that are that have these kinds of models integrated into them pretty soon. So imagine um, that a kid is like, play, is, you know, says to their like robot companion, "I want to play dolls. Please go get me a scientist." And they always bring her Ken instead of Barbie. Um, and this is what happens when these models are basically just a regurgitation of everything on the internet. Um, so the last thing that I'll point out as we as we continue this conversation um, about ethics is that um, this is something that is really important for us to be thinking about right now, not just misinformation. I'm sure you can all name a dozen more ethical issues that are happening here. Um, but there is there is a speed at which this is moving. Uh, right now that I think is problematic. There are some ways that we need to pull back um, and make sure that we're not, as this person from Microsoft said, um, waiting to see what we need to fix later. Uh, it might be too late. The harm might already be done by then. Um, there ha you also might have heard a lot of calls for like slowing down AI or <laughs> um, because we're worried about like, these very existential risks like human extinction. Um, uh, my take on this is that, um, it's a little bit of a distraction to be saying that what we really need to be worried about is human extinction when there are a whole lot of other things, um, that are actual tangible problems that we know about and are happening uh, right now. So anyway, this statement from the uh, Center for AI Safety that I, uh, that, that you might've seen recently, I would... <clears throat> amend a little bit um, and say that we should uh, mitigating the risk of AI should be a global priority, but I don't think that we should 
we need to think that far in the future yet, because right now there are a lot of harms that we already know about. Um, and so I am going to leave it there um, and, and looking forward to a good conversation. Great. Thank you, Casey. Um, really great stage setting here. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, an audience member had a little bit of a technical question about the platforms, and then we're going to jump into a lot of openings you left us, which was about specifically in chat GPT, but the idea of these, these things having modules or templates embedded within them. So if you gave them a prompt, you know, for writing a script or something, are you going to see a similar template sort or module kind of coming out um, over the course of time? Or um, depending on that prompt, you're really going to see a really diverse variety. Um, you would see a... He, you would probably see a pretty good variety. Um, though I will say that ChatGPT has some memory. So if you are using your same account, um, it might give you some things that are very similar. Um, you know, the 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 weirder something you ask for is the <laughs> um, the more likely I think there is to be a lot of of variation. Um, the, there does tend to there's like a, a particular style of speech though that you're getting out of it. I am I am finding that I can I can spot something written by ChatGPT much easier than I could 6 months ago. Um but no it's just, it is definitely generating everything on the fly. Again, it's it, it's 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 it is word by word. Um what word is is next? So there aren't any like um preset templates or that kind of thing at least not in in not in ChatGPT. Great. And when you teach about this and you also have students engaging with you, you know, I, I've heard people have concerns about plagiarism, you know, and stuff. How could you talk a little bit about that and what you see as like the risk or not the risk around plagiarism? Because I know there's also tools there. Yeah. Um, so this has obviously been a huge topic of conversation. And I have to say, it feels a little bit um, short-sighted for it to me that OpenAI released ChatGPT at the beginning of September or beginning of December, which was literally right when students were just about to do final papers and <laughs> exams and that sort of thing. So teachers were very worried about this because there was no time for anyone to like react and uh, adjust and sort you know, figure out how to handle this. Um, one way that I think about this is that, so ChatGPT Chat and other technologies like this are a tool. Um, it, so sometimes people will say to educators like, oh, you know, would you keep your students from using a calculator? Would you keep your students from using spell check? And the answer is, of course not. Um, uh, the different, the, but I would keep my students from using spell check if it was a spelling test. Um, and so the difference here is you need to figure out when something is a spelling test and when it's not, uh, if, if that makes sense. Like, should you, you know, I think it's totally reasonable for uh, educators to tell their students to not use ChatGPT in certain types of situations, but there are others in which it might be totally appropriate. Now, if we're worried about students cheating, um, which of course is a thing that happens, um, I've heard a lot of educators talking about how to adjust their ways of evaluating learning to make sure that that's not something that is feasible to do. Um, or, you know, telling students that they're allowed to use it as long as they say how they used it and making sure that they're meeting certain types of learning objectives. Um, there are detectors, but they're not very good yet. I've seen examples where people ran you know, excerpts from the constitution and through the Bible, uh, the Bible through these detectors and they showed up as chat GPT generated. <laughs> so, um, and I, I worry a lot about false positives and this kind of thing. I feel the same way about plagiarism detectors though. I think that a lot of educators spend far too much time trying to keep students who shouldn't get A's from getting A's and not enough time trying to make sure the students who should get A's do get A's. Um, so I think that we're going to see some changes in education, but in the meantime, you know, I, I, I hope that people are patient uh, with educators and that educators um, are understanding uh, of their students, not jumping ahead too much, not always assuming the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, how are you seeing these tools being used or taken up with um, the news media and journalists? You know, I know certain newsrooms have policies and certain ones don't, and I can imagine it's a quickly evolving landscape. Do you have a good uh, set on like how this is and isn't being used or some of the concerns um, in our journalism? 
Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm not super worried about like actual legitimate journalists, um, using <laughs> these tools extensively, um, in part because the risk of bat of, of, um, incorrect information would be, would be so strong. I mean, maybe they're using it to help edit the writing or that sort of thing. Uh, what I'm more concerned about are like, uh, you know, new, like news farms, blog farms, like the way that you could, the, the way that you could, I mean, BuzzFeed news just went away, but like, uh, imagine, like, think back to like, sort of the, the genre of BuzzFeed that was like, you know, here's the top 20, blah, blah, blah. Like you could write 10 of those in five minutes using, <laughs> using chat GPT. Um, so I think, you know, we're going to see that kind of thing, um, which again, might not be intentional misinformation, but could, you know, end up having, uh, having some misinformation. Um, the other thing that I imagine journalists are worried about, but also any, you know, any kinds of writers are, um, uh, uh, job loss and also like ways that their content is being used without their consent. Because, you know, if you're, if you've been a journalist for a while, then I guarantee you that your, uh, that your writing is in the training data for these models. Um, and we were hearing a lot about this from artists, but it's really true for any, anyone who's ever written anything on the internet. So are there any copyright protections built in? Whereas, I mean, that's kind of a little bit of what you're alluding to it to some degree. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so, so the first thing I'll say is that I, I think that, um, uh, legal issues around this and ethical issues around this are very different. I think those are two different things and I feel differently about them actually. Um, so I, in general, my, my dissertation was actually about fair use. Um, <laughs> so, and I'm actually very sort of pro fair use. Like I'm, I'm pro content reuse. I think it's, it's important. I think that, uh, Copyright law can sometimes be used to stifle creativity um, and and innovation, um, and so the the argument that OpenAI or you know anyone who has made one of these models would use is that their use of all of this data from the internet is uh, fair use, um, uh, which is basically an exception to copyright law. It's what allows for you know things like quoting a book in a book review um, or you know news news. Uh, showing images of things and this sort of thing. Um, probably the most the most related sort of existing precedent for this is Google Books. So Google Books was Google was sued because of basically you know scraping a bunch of books to create <laughs> Google Books, um, and that was found to be fair use because they used books to make a search engine. Um, and that was like considered to be a very different sort of like, like a transformation of the content. Here, what you're doing though is like using books to make books, which I actually think could be considered quite differently. Um, but I think that the underlying ethical issue has to do with like using using people's work without their consent, without attributing it to them, and in a way that could hurt could hurt the, those people, right? So if you are a stock photo artists, like your job is you take stock photos for a living. Like I'm, I'm a little bit concerned. Uh, there, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that AI is taking all of our, actually, sorry, I, uh, I don't I actually don't like it when people word it that way. AI is not taking your jobs. Uh, humans are firing you. <laughs> Uh, um, but I don't think we have to worry about, you know, job loss for, for everything from AI, but things like stock photo artists or like artists who take commissions to create the, you know, uh, covers for self-published books, like things like that. I think, you know, if you're someone who wasn't going to pay a lot of money for something in the first place could be, um, replaced by using these image generators. And so knowing that, you know, all of your art is like, training the technology that could make you uh, lose your livelihood is I think a significant kind of ethical concern regardless of the legality of it. I want to pick up on a few of these things as we go through <clears throat> some of that workforce stuff that you alluded to but let me focus in on this ethical conversation since that is definitely what your a lot of your background is in and when you were talking about you know <clears throat> ethical uses or not of it um 
are we talking about how do we ethically put some ethical boundaries around the platform and that conversation? Or are you thinking about users? Because that is, those would be very dramatically different approaches. And when you have something open source, how do you put ethics, you know, around that? Um, so talk to me a little bit more about when you think ethically around these platforms, what are these big buckets and how do you, how do you think through some of these challenges that we should be talking about? Yeah, so so I so I think what you're getting at is you know uh, where where are we looking at the responsibility here? Is it uh, the people who are creating and releasing these technologies, or you know are we thinking about how people use it? Um, so uh, you know I've 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 already heard of some. Oh, actually, I I can think of even worse examples of this, but I'll go. But so it's not to bring up bad things. Um, I'll go back to misinformation, right? So if someone uses um uh mid journey to create uh an image of you know a politician doing something that they clearly you know they did not do and then releasing it and pretending it's real and that it impacts people and it affects an election um yes it is obviously the fault and responsibility of the person who did that um however i would argue that knowing that this is a problem, knowing that this is a particular kind of bad actor adversarial use case, that there is some responsibility on the creators of this technology to try to mitigate that harm as much as possible. Um, and we, I mean, you know, we've talked like a very obvious kind of thing um, is certain types of watermarks, including I mean, not something as, you know, as simple as like a, you know, image watermark that you could take off, but like embedded, like watermarks embedded into the metadata, into the, into the code. Um, and obviously there are ways around these things, but anything that you can do to, to add more fr friction um, to these kinds of uh, negative uses of this technology, I think are really important. And at this point, we can't pretend like we don't know what the problems are going to be. They knew like before this was released. And actually an interesting example is, so I showed you the mid-journey, um, uh, the computer science professor example. Um, Dolly actually has a bias mitigation technique to prevent that from happening. Um, so if you go to Dolly and ask for an image of a computer science professor, it will not give you, uh, so they have groups of four as well. It will probably give you uh, three white men and one a woman or black man or something like that. Um, the reason is because they know about the bias in their training data. They know that it's very likely that the results are going to end up skewing towards, frankly, white people for everything or like stereotypes um, because of the training data. And so they actually append demographic features onto the end of search results for a small subset of the results. So what you would end up with is like computer science professors, three white men, and then it will give you the last result will be image of a computer science professor, black woman. Um, so that's something that they put into the design of the technology to ensure that those uh, results were not as biased as they would be otherwise. You mentioned the introduction of friction <clears throat> into this. What are some examples that we currently have or that you could envision helping with that? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so again, I, th I think that um, uh, watermarking, uh, there are certain types of watermarking that it would, it, it would cause additional friction to be able to remove it. Like I, I, I can't think of ways you would do it that it would be impossible to get, <laughs> to get around, but you can imagine uh, ways of getting around it. Um, uh, I mean, I also think there, there might be some extent where, if, um, I actually think the watermarking thing would apply, could potentially apply as well to people using these systems in deceptive ways. So like students cheating is another, you know, example, um, that people are really concerned about and people, and they really do want like detectors. Um, and I do think that with some more work, there should be able to be some kind of actually accurate detector for these systems. Um, the way that you end up doing that is like having basically um, certain types of statistical regularities in the output that you could check for. Um, I mean, and when I, so adding friction to that, 
it would at least mean that you would then have to paraphrase it, right? <laughs> like, yes, you could paraphrase it. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I made some TikToks early on about it's uh, chat GPT's tendency to fabricate sources is like to make sure that like people knew that this was a thing and, you know, students could know that was a thing. And someone said like, oh, well, you know, I know that I shouldn't use those sources. Instead, you know, I, I, I go find other sources that are like appropriate and I cite those instead. And I was like, man, it sounds like you're like doing a big part of the assignment yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think, so I think that would be, uh, would be an example as well. Yeah, I, I, I want to say for you, giving you a little preview, Casey, in our audience, like as we get towards the end here, like what are the things we should be looking for? Like what are those tools and tips? So let's come back to that towards the end. It's our, like that, those pieces of advice that you give people. Um, but let me pull in a little bit of an audience question here because um, it's a little bit in the frame of um, biases which is the idea of um, a chatbot choosing each word uh, you know, on the phrases and, and what's next. Um, is it gonna be reflective of just that, he says the zeitgeist, right? The culture of the day, um, or is that gonna be able to change over time? Um, well, right now, ChatGPT um, is based on training data that I think is not earlier than 2021. Um, so again, it's not, it's not like, it's not a search engine. So it's not like looking for new information. It's this, uh, model. Um, uh, I, I, I assume they will continue to be updated. Of course, um, a, a concern that I have, that I've been hearing about recently is around, um, model collapse, uh, which basically means that if you took, um, uh, and I, I also, by the way, when I say chat GBT, I'm, I'm using that because most people know what it is, but it's obviously chat GBT is like the, the chat bot instantiation of GPT three and GPT four, which are the actual models. <laughs> um, but if you, if you took, um, actually it's some researchers did this recently, they, they took GPT three and generated some, um, output and then trained, further trained the model on that output, new output, trained the model again on that output. And within like five or six generations, it was just giving you garbage. <laughs> um, so they, they referred to that as model collapse. Basically the idea that like, if, if AI is being trained off of its own output, over time, it just degrades um, because like, again, it's, it's this like probabilistic model of what's happening. And so you're looking for essentially like statistical regularities in the data. And if you keep getting the same statistical regularities over and over and over again, they sort of compound and, and become gibberish. Um, whereas if you, ha you know, if you have human data that's created by human, it doesn't have those kinds of, of regularities because we are very irregular. Um, so I, 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 I additionally, ha this is only slightly related to that question, but like I do have this concern that the more AI generated content we have on the internet, which like, I mean, it, it really could explode. Um, I heard someone say recently, like, are we, could we get to a point in the future where, you know, more of all of the content that we have access to is created by AI than was ever created by humans, which is like not outside the realm of possibility. So if we get to that point um, and we're just training AI off of more that was created by <laughs> AI, um, there's this, we're gonna be just seeing the same kind of thing over and over or potentially even just like down to garbage. Um, I recently, so the, the creator of Black Mirror, Charlie Brooker, said that he had ChatGBT write a Black Mirror episode for him, and it was bad. The reason it was bad was because it was an it was just a, a it was just like what you would expect a Black Mirror episode to be, because that's that's what it gives you, right? It's it's giving you what it what it you expect it to be. That's the whole point. ChatGPT is just a jumble of tropes. Um, it's it's not giving you you know, things that are creative. And when I asked for, you know, Star Trek fan fiction set at the Denver Museum, 
it, and it can do that. You're like, wow, that's so creative. That wasn't it being creative. That was me being creative, right? Uh, <laughs> and so I think that's something that's really important to to know as well. So this isn't creativity. It's just this, you know, jumble of, of tropes. Um, I want to shift <clears throat> to talking. Um, I want to do a little segue and then shift to talking about policy uh, and regulation or not. Um, but before I do, you had a bunch of headlines from um, news sources there at the beginning. You've talked a little bit about this, but you know, for our audience and for myself, I'm quite curious on the spectrum, right? Uh, feeling like things are are exaggerated, you know, and um, or we should be concerned. Um, where do you kind of fall on on this? And what and, and is our media also? Um, where, where do you think they are falling on some of the current conversations based on some of the news headlines I've read? Um, so again, my, my take on the sort of AI safety crowd is that it's a little, and I say, so a AI safety tends to be a little bit more concerned with this like existential risk, like the human race is going to go extinct because of AI. Um, uh, I tend to find that distracting. <laughs> Um, not everyone feels this way. There's actually a lot of disagreement in the sort of like AI safety ethics community. Um, but I just, I, I find that a bit distracting from the current um, problems. And one of the reasons I feel this way, this might be a slightly ungenerous interpretation, though there are some, some things that support this interpretation. Um, some of the folks who are involved in the, who are directly involved in the development um, of AI, like OpenAI CEO, um, have been very vocal about the importance of regulating AI, but then they are very specific that what they mean is regulating it to prevent human extinction. Um, so like OpenAI put out a blog post about the importance of governance towards um, super, governance of super intelligence. Um, we are like multiple steps away from super intelligence right now. So if you've heard about like, so narrow AI is um, uh, like AI that does a very specific task, like the, the machine learning stuff that I was talking about, you know, AI, they can tell you what a dog is. <laughs> um, and there's general AI, which is like AI that could do anything. We're not to general AI yet. And then beyond general AI is super intelligence, which is the idea of AI that is, you know, smarter and better in every way than humans. Um, so anyway, OpenAI said that we should govern, uh, start thinking about governance of super intelligence because it's coming. Uh, but then in this blog post was like, but to be clear, we're not saying that you should be applying these regulations to what exists now. Um, and so I just, I just want to make sure that we don't get so focused on like, regulating for the robot wars that we don't worry about things like misinformation and and bias and these really like real harms and I'm someone who thinks it's actually very important to look towards the future um but I think sometimes you get a little bit in the weeds um thinking that that far ahead um and at you know at, should we get to a point where there's some like the other thing is I don't I don't hear people talking about like in what way humans are going extinct. <laughs> Whereas I understand exactly what's happening with things like job loss and misinformation and bias. So you were talking about, you know, these conversations around policy and regulation and, and what the conversation is coming at from, mm. you know, the tech sector side and open AI side. Uh, there's this new act, an AI act that um, the European Union Parliament uh, adopted, I think just this month or last month. Um, obviously it hasn't completely passed, but it's expected to be approved this year. And I think some of the focus on it from what I was reading was on transparency and identifying those potential risks. Um, to me, talk to us, is this that first step in government for trying to figure out where and how it could potentially be used to regulate or to set policy? Um, talk to me about some of the challenges of regulating and creating policies and where do you see opportunities in this conversation? Yeah, um, so the the AI um, Act that is um, uh, the like draft language for that was just passed in the EU and the European Parliament. Um, uh, so it's a it is a risk based framework, um, and so basically the idea there is that you know each e each technology has 
it, its own sort of risk analysis and then how it's dealt with and what kinds of restraints it has are based on that risk. Um, so the idea is that some things might be so risky that they would be banned outright. Um, other things might, you know, be required to have audits or something like that. And some things might be so low risk that they're barely regulated at all. Um, so the, the specific example that I remember is that, and this has definitely not been decided. My understanding is that there is um, arguments over whether this would be the case, but an example of something I've seen that could potentially be banned under uh, this regulation would be emotion recognition AI. Um, that like AI that, um, you know, determines someone's emotion from their voice or their gait or their um, uh, face, uh, the benefits don't outweigh the risks um, of uh, bias, for example, and misuses um, by law enforcement would be the example that comes to mind. Um, they're also, you know, part of this also might be as well, like, oh, well, you can't use this in certain types of contexts um, would be another example of regulation there. Um, the U.S., uh, does not really have AI regulation yet. Um, last year, the office, the the White House Office of Science and Technology put out the AI Bill of Rights, the blueprint for the. It's called a blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights. Um, this was worked on by some like very excellent uh, people in the sort of like AI ethics and fairness space, and it's actually a really nice uh, document that lays out um, a lot of. Uh, concerns about AI. Now, interestingly, when I first started talking about this, a lot of people thought that I meant um, like <laughs> rights for the AI. So not robot rights, but our rights, <laughs> human rights in the context of, of AI. So th things like certain types of consent requirements and transparency requirements and this sort of thing. Um, I would like to see something like that be a blueprint um, for legislation. I mean, I think this is someone who, so as someone who um, uh, has a law degree and has done some like legal advocacy work, I tend to be a bit pessimistic about <laughs> regulation. Um, and like just the fact that we like barely have any data privacy regulation in this country. And it's been how long since this has been a huge issue. I've, I'm a little bit skeptical. <laughs> uh, uh, and, you know, part of this has to do with lobbying. I mean, the other thing that I saw recently um, is that, um, you know, OpenAI CEO, while like talking about how important regulation is, was like quietly <laughs> lobbying the EU uh, lawmakers um, against some of the things in the, in the AI Act. Um, and so, unfortunately, uh, you know, a lot. Uh, so here's another big picture point when it comes to ethics and what's happening with AI right now. Um, this has the ability to concentrate even more power in the hands of people who already have all the power. Um, I think, you know, I think this is true because of the, you know, small number of big tech companies that we have. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is, this is what concerns me. And I think that that's one of the big obstacles for regulation, particularly in the U.S., is um, power differentials, uh, which is, I don't know that I have, you know, a good solution to that, unfortunately. But acknowledging it, for sure. <sighs> um, what about our, uh, we had an audience member who was curious about any sort of um, regulation or structure or guardrails that we could put around um, data sets and the input side of it that is used to potentially create these products. You had already alluded to different versions of people putting in a bias check, in essence, around what gets produces the output. Is that being done or is that still just, um, you know, individual companies and tech companies uh, uh, doing that within their own software? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, and that's not even, that's not, e that's not even about the data set. That's like, a, we can't, we know we can't fix the data set. So we're going to do this other thing instead, which I think is far more, con it is extremely hard, if not impossible, frankly, to de-bias data sets of this. I mean, I, this, I mean, just the magnitude is is hard to wrap your head around. Um, most of the conversations that I've been seeing around data sets have been around these like ownership and consent issues. 
Um, I recently went to some of the listening sessions that the copyright office was having with like artists and authors and that sort of thing. And there are, there are a lot of people who think that there should be like, um, like a licensing, uh, regime for AI. Um, uh, so like the way that music cop, what uh, music copyright is incredibly complicated, but one of the weird things about um, music copyright and like people getting paid is that there's an organization or multiple organizations. I think one of them is ASCAP that basically, um, takes in all of the revenue that should be paid to composers for things like their, their, um, songs being played in bars and on the radio and that sort of thing. And as opposed to like, you know, a radio station having to like keep track of every song that they play and like giving, you know, five cents to that person, like how streaming works. Um, this organization takes all of this money and then like doles it out to people based on how popular their song is at any given time is a very simplistic explanation, but there's been discussions of that. Like is like basically the idea here and, and this again, I, I, like, I don't know about legally, but ethically, I feel this pretty strongly which is, I do think there's an issue with the fact that, you know, open AI, and again, I just keep picking on them because that's who everyone talks about, but they're not the only ones, um, created this immensely profitable <laughs> um, uh, technology that absolutely could not exist were it not for all of the, all of the input from all of these humans, you know, who created all the data that trains it without any kind of uh, compensation. Um, I mean, that said, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the, all these ethical issues, et cetera. I am not, I'm not uh, anti-AI. Um, I actually think that a lot of these technologies have the ability to do things that are pretty darn cool. Um, but I think that if something is going to be as transformative and like change the world as much as people think that it's going to, it is incredibly important uh, that we figure these things out so that we don't get to a place where it's done more, more harm than good. I'm going to pick up what you just said, because we have um, a couple of different questions from the audience I'm going to weave together, which is, mm. you know, humans, this person had a beautiful opening for their question, which was humans have this long history of developing new technologies and then sometimes struggling to ensure that the impacts are beneficial. Um, and so is AI one of those? And another person's really curious, like what is it really gonna be useful for, right? And I'm wondering if, you know, you just said like you are actually pretty, you know, supportive of it in general, like what is the benefit of it to us? Yeah, um, so I, we have, I do think like we have seen this before. I think, I think that this could be bigger than some of the ways we've seen this before. But I think that there are some similarities to, for example, the early days of the internet. I mean, if you think about how trans, like think about how completely different the world would be if there were no internet. Um, and if you look back at like the science fiction from like the mid, you know, mid 20th century, there was no internet and, you know, where's my flying car? But like, this thing is pretty great. Uh, <laughs> um, so I don't know that there's anything super different, but I do think it's pretty extreme. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, so I, I do think that there are, um, uh, going to be benefits of this technology, like cool things that we can, we can do with it. Um, I lost track a little bit of your question. <laughs> so really it's actually that. you, right? Like what, what, yeah. what do we really think this is going to, is it really useful for it? It's in a yeah. huge um, advancement, but, um, um Okay, so here, you know, okay, a lot of people are very concerned about job loss. Um, and again, I think it's very important to remember that AI is not taking people's jobs. Humans are firing them. What companies are firing them? What companies could, so, so let's say that um, copywriting is now so much faster because of AI. Like you, and you're like, okay, you know, we now only need one copywriter instead of five. So we're gonna fire four copywriters what if you gave that one copywriter a three-hour work week instead and paid them the same? <laughs> like AI should be able to augment what we're doing as humans so that it's faster, more efficient, um, and, and that sort of thing, so that maybe we don't have to work ourselves to death. 
Like to me, that's, and, and I say this and I'm like, that's the dream that, you know, AI is going to result in us being able to have shorter work weeks. Maybe we even get to the point and, you know, very far in the future. But if, if, if AI continues to be as transformative as people say it will be, maybe we need universal basic income. Like, but I would, I would love to see a world in which the, 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 it's not like, oh no, AI takes everyone's job. And instead it's like, what if we didn't have to work as much, but still like got paid a living wage and, <laughs> um, which I think, you know, I think that kind of thing is very challenging, but there are things that AI can do to help people um, with the kinds of, of work that we're doing. And that's how I would like to see it as an augmentation uh, rather than a replacement. Um, and, you know, it's not going to write very good fan fiction. Like, I'm going to go read stuff written by real fan fiction writers. <laughs> All right, we're going to kind of wrap up here in just a few minutes. But um, for our audience, what are some ways or recommendations you'd give for people who want to cross-check the trustworthiness of some of this information, right? Like, what are those tips that you give people? Yeah, well, you know, some of this is like so simplistic, but if, but um, you really do have to fact check ChatGPT, um, for example, like it's, 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 it's very important. <laughs> um, if, it, if it's giving you any information that's of consequence, like go search for it in the way that you would have searched for the information before. And maybe it will have now given you some keywords that will make that searching easier. Um, when it comes to things like deep fakes, I would just, and this is the same thing that I would have said before it was as easy as it is to create them now. Um, you just need to be incredibly cognizant of where information is coming from. Like if you see an image on Twitter, like why would you trust that that's true? Right. In the same way, you know, people I'm, so I'm, I, I talk about this stuff on TikTok um, and people will ask all the time, like, oh, you know, all this educational content on TikTok, but like, why would you ever believe anything you hear on TikTok? Like, you, and it's not that you don't, it's not that you believe things because you hear it on TikTok, you believe because it's me. And that's why I, you know, have my real name and my credentials there. And when I tell you something about AI, like maybe you believe it, but some like random person with zero followers and you have no idea who they are, why would you believe them? And that is just what we need to apply to everything now, unfortunately. Um, and so we really need to be able um, to figure out how the source of information is credible or not. Great. Um, Casey, let me give you kind of final word here. Uh, what should we be paying attention to next in this space? Like where are you spending a lot of your time thinking and, and that you think some of us should be thinking a little bit more critically about? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about basically exactly what you just, uh, what you just asked me about. How can, I also think that, I think that if people have a, an even better understanding of how these technologies work, they can have a better understanding of their limitations. Um, and so that's what I think is really important right now is that, is this education around like, what are these systems like it, re, you know, again, very simplistically, but it's fancy autocomplete, not magic. <laughs> um, and I think that that's really important for people to understand. And also in some ways it might make them less scared of some of these like really like, you know, the world is probably not ending tomorrow, which I think would, would be a good thing for people to not think, <laughs> think right away. There's a lot of hard problems in the world and society, right? And I think it's kind of, how do we, how do we find the ones that we can deal with right now and focus on those and, and, and work on everything collectively together. Um, and you're right, like focus on the things that we need to focus on today to fix. Um, Casey, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was a big topic and I think you covered it brilliantly and hit on a lot of the subject areas. Um, we didn't get to you know nearly half the questions that we had from our audience, but we had some amazing ones. So a huge thank you for joining us today. It's my great pleasure to spend some time with you and, and get to know you and talk about this before today as well. Um, huge thank you, obviously, to our audience for joining us. Nicole dropped in some links to the chat. Uh, we'll send those out in an email as well as a follow-up uh, if you want to share it with any kind of colleagues or friends or family who you think would find this of interesting to watch. Uh, we'll come back for another episode in this series at the end of July, July 31st, so mark your calendar. 
Um, we're going to take on another interesting topic, which is the topic of carbon capture technology. Um, and I'm guessing we'll probably come back to this AI conversation. There's so much here to, to unpack um, as well. So thank you all for joining us today. Great to see many of you. And a huge thank you, obviously, to Dr. Fiesler for joining us. Uh, thank enjoy you. the rest of your day. Take care.